Amen. Welcome to church and Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Is anybody else a little excited about the Christmas season? I hope so. New Haven, can we just take a moment and welcome our Middletown location? God bless you, Vox Middletown. We love you. Welcome to church. Come on, put your hands together and say hello. Streaming live to Middletown right now. All of our micro church locations gathering across Connecticut, Massachusetts, and of course everybody online. Grateful to worship Jesus with you. If you were with us last week, we wrapped up a teaching series called More Than Alive. And last week was Vision Sunday. Talked about where we've been, where we're going. We received our end of year offering. Everything that's given to Vox from now to the end of the year goes towards those goals that we outlined. And so thank you for being generous, for being a part of the mission moving forward. It's Christmas time. And I want to study today a text that you have probably heard before, whether it be at church or just in all of the Christmas celebrations, a pretty common text. It is in the prophet Isaiah chapter 9. I'm just going to focus on one verse today because I believe that the spirit of the living God has something for your life today In this verse. And so I just encourage you to get your faith up, prepare your heart to hear from heaven. Uh, You're not interested in what I think, that's good because neither am I, but I'm interested in what God thinks and I believe He has something to say to you today. In verse 6, it says this For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on His shoulders, and He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. Prince of Peace. If you want to jot some notes down, title of the sermon today is Christmas Received. Christmas Received. Let's pray together. Lord, today we want to receive the truth of Christmas. We want to receive the truth of your grace. And so I pray that today you would open our hearts in a way that we can't even open them ourselves. I pray that you would speak truths to our soul today that would be written deep through the truth of Christ written on our souls. God, that you would do a supernatural work where you write your words on our hearts, where you make your truth plain to us by your Holy Spirit. God, I pray that you do a work in us that would leave us changed forever today. In Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen, amen, amen. March 15th, 2020, a day to remember in the history of the world. It was the day... That Disney World closed. The day that Disney World closed, if you're a big Disney World fan, you know that due to COVID-19, Disney had to close this year for a while. They have reopened, but, uh, but they did close for a season. And on March 15th, a bunch of little kids' dreams were spoiled, right? And the 16th, and the 17th, and the 18th. You know, 58 million people visit Disney World every year. Isn't that amazing? 58 million people visit Disney World every year. And for a season this year, they were closed. I do think that, uh, that in our culture, in our time, Disney World is a little bit of a rite of passage. There is this expectation that if you have kids, you will one day bring them to Disney. If you don't feel that expectation, God bless you. Live in your freedom. But I know that, uh, that for me, you know, my kids started looking at me like, Dad, are you going to be a good parent or not? You know, And like there is this pressure. We had some friends. They live in North Carolina. They went to Disney World. They started showing us pictures. And all of our kids were like, <coughs> Dad. Mom, do you love us or not? It's time to go. And so we have gone to Disney World. We went a couple years ago with Matt and Kate DeSissia, our Hartford uh, and Springfield campus pastor and his family. And uh, and we had a good time at Disney World. But I remember driving in. And if you've ever been, you know what I'm talking about. You get there and there's this big sign. It says Walt Disney World. And underneath it says, where dreams come true. I mean, that's a pretty big statement, right? Where dreams come true. I've got some significant dreams, Walt. And I'm not sure you're going to be able to fulfill them all. But... They, they set the precedent that it is going to be a place where dreams come true. And you get there, you start walking down the cobblestone streets, you go to Tom Sawyer Island, you go to Swiss Family Robinson Treehouse, you have a conversation with the Muppets, you give a high five to Tigger, you go on Space Mountain, and I'm telling you, something starts to change. Something in your heart, something in your attitude starts to change. And I watched my family, my kids, and my wife just sort of like come alive through Disney, you know, and I think the strangest change of all was Matt DeSissio himself. Uh, I call him Cheech as a nickname for his last name. And, uh, and he 
transformed into Disney Cheech when we went to Disney World. He was lighter and happier and bubblier and he was just different. Something changed. What is the something that Disney markets? Why do 58 million people pack into Disney World every year? Why do we pay hundreds, even thousands of dollars to travel to Florida just to be able to see Mickey up close and personal? I think one word describes it all. And it's wonder, wonder, right? Wonder, this idea of awe, this idea of amazement. There's something inside of us that all longs for wonder. You want to be amazed. You want to have that feeling, that thing inside of you that makes life feel magical. And I think that in our world today, we are living in a wonderless time where we've got statistics to explain everything and science and data and technology. And oftentimes the things in our lives that were once wonderful now have been flattened out and made normal or explained. I can remember as a young man, the first time I ever went to Reykjavik, Iceland. It is a wonderful place. It's a strange place. If you ever go to Reykjavik, I remember getting off the airplane and trying to count how long it would take before I saw a tree. It was about 45 minutes driving from the airport before I saw a tree because everything around me was just volcanic rock and moss. And it was an incredible place. And some of the people that we were with while we were there took us to this place called the Blue Lagoon, which is a geothermal spa with bright blue water and white moss on the bottom that the water heats up to about 100, 102 degrees and the air is freezing cold and all around it is volcanic rock and mountains with snow caps on top and you're sitting in this water at 100 degrees looking out and I can remember just thinking, this is amazing. This place is like no other place I've ever been. I literally feel like I'm on Mars and I can remember my heart having that same Disney feeling, you know, that sense of awe, that sense of wonder. When, let me ask you, today was the last time you felt that feeling. When's the last time you were swept up a little bit? Just recently, I was was watching TV and David Attleboro was on with one of his Planet Earth shows. And if you know him, just his voice makes me feel that sense of awe and wonder, you know? The toad is the most amazing creature. You know, and you listen to him, you're like, wow, that is an amazing creature. You know, it's just like, I started feeling that feeling again, but maybe for you it was, you know, when a child was born and you were in the delivery room or maybe you were the mom and you had a little bit more to do with the process and, and you just experienced the awe and the amazement of a child coming into this earth or you look up at the sky and you know, you're busy, you got things going on, but all of a sudden it catches you. You go, whoa, whoa, look at that. And you feel that sense of awe. That sense of wonder. Remember when you were a little kid and you go out and play in the woods and you just create this whole world for yourself out there. And it wasn't just sticks and rocks and leaves. It was treasure and amazement and awe and wonder. And yet I feel like we've lost that. I think maybe this year more than ever, we've lost the sense of awe and the sense of wonder. And I think that if we're honest, some of us are kind of stumbling into Christmas. Like, oh, Christmas is in a few days. Shoot. Let me get on Amazon real quick and see what I can still order. You know, like it's Christmas already. The world has been so chaotic, so unpredictable this year that we find ourselves sort of staggering into Christmas. You know, here we are Christmas. Let's just get through it so we can get to 2021 as fast as possible. Because some of us are just drained and tired. I was getting a coffee the other day and I was at Starbucks and they handed me the cup and it said on the cup, tidings of coffee and joy. And I thought to myself, that's all we have left now. It used to be tidings of comfort and joy, but now the comfort's gone. We just have coffee. That's all we've got. We have, we have degenerated down to tidings of coffee and joy. All I want is a decent cup of coffee, and that's all I can expect out of life at this point. Well, what if today at church, the Spirit of Jesus came upon your soul in such a profound and personal way that you realized his nearness afresh, that you experienced his glory anew. What if God would reach down today and he would turn that wonder dial up a few notches so that you began to become once again aware of the glorious, amazing, beautiful God who is not so far, who is not so weak, but who is strong, mighty, powerful, and available. What if your heart was just swept up for a few moments today 
in wonder and awe and amazement of him. That's my prayer for you. That's my desire for your heart today. The prophet Isaiah speaks of a coming savior, a Messiah, 600 plus years before he would walk planet earth. Jesus is spoken of by the prophet. And he says, the first thing you got to understand about him is we're going to call his name wonderful. Everybody say wonderful. Wonderful. That wasn't everybody, but we'll go with it. Wonderful. Wonderful. He's going to be wonderful. In other words, if you're ever going to understand him or know him or experience him, you've got to come with that sense of awe. And sometimes I think we've heard the Christmas story in Jesus and we lose that sense of awe, that sense of wonder. I pray that it would just be rejuvenated in your heart today. If you're ever going to engage Jesus in a genuine way, you've got to be in awe. And I think that if you look at him in all the different angles that you could look at Jesus, he is in every way a wonderful person. He is a person of awe. Just think of it in the practical sense for a moment. How does a man who was born in a tiny little town with no wealth, no status, no prestige on the outside, dead at 33 years old, how does this man become by far the most influential human to ever walk the earth? It's a question of awe, a question of wonder. You know, with every person on the planet, every year after their death, they become less and less significant. And so great leaders, great people in this planet, we kind of forget about them after a while, but it's not true with Jesus. In fact, today he's more famous than he ever was before today, his truths and faith in him is spreading faster than it ever has before in the history of the human race. That when a hundred years had passed, Jesus was more famous and then another 200 years more famous. Now here we are 2000 years after he lived on this planet and we have 25% of the world worshiping him and over three quarters of the world very aware of who he is. What a wonder. What an amazement. And you see the influence that Jesus had. Some sociologists have tried to articulate or measure the level of influence that this one simple man has had on planet earth and it is beyond measure. No one has influenced the world in the area of the arts or science or government or education or ethics as much as Jesus. No one has changed people's perspective on children or women or power or leadership or literacy like Jesus. It was followers of Jesus who started the first universities, the first orphanages, the first hospitals, who really began to fight for human rights, for the end of slavery, and on and on and on and on. The influence of Jesus. One Yale historian said it like this. He said, regardless of what anyone may personally think or believe about him, Jesus of Nazareth has been the dominant figure in the history of Western culture for almost 20 centuries. Come on, you don't think about that much, but what a wonder it is in the natural sense. What a wonder. H.G. Wells said it like this. He said, a historian like myself who doesn't even call himself a Christian finds the picture centering irresistibly around the life and character of this most significant man. How is it that he become so significant, Albert Einstein said it like this. I love this. I'm a Jew, but I am enthralled by the luminous figure of the Nazarene. Jesus is too colossal for the pen of phrase mongers, however artful. No man can read the Gospels without feeling the actual presence of Jesus. His personality pulsates in every word. No myth is filled with such life. You think about the great art, the great scientific advancements of the human race. Things like Da Vinci's Last Supper, who inspired it? Jesus. Or Rembrandt's Prodigal Son, who inspired it? Jesus. Or Leo Tolstoy's War and Peace, who inspired it? Jesus. Or Victor Hugo's Les Miserables, who inspired it? Jesus. You look at Isaac Newton and his great discoveries in science with Jesus as his inspiration. I was just reading recently about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who came to a place in his life where his life was at risk on a daily basis and the anxiety of that risk was was absolutely debilitating him until he had an encounter with Jesus. And he said that encounter with Jesus Christ was so life changing for me that it gave me the strength to continue on my mission. Jesus influencing so many in so many significant ways. The luminous figure of the Nazarene says Einstein. He stands over history. What a wonder. And Isaiah says that if you're ever going to understand him, you've got to wonder. And you've got to look at him through these various names that he's given here. And I love that. It's kind of like a diamond, you know. You look at a diamond, it has different angles, different shades, different glories with each angle. And so it is with the names that were given in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. He's a wonderful counselor. 
Go ahead and look at that person next to you and tell them you need a counselor. <laughs> Come on, you can tell them. You need, you know it's true, right? You need a counselor. You really do. You do. You know that word is translated guide. I think that a lot of us don't realize how difficult and frustrating it is to not have someone alongside us who's been there and done that. You know, there's something in our hearts that we want somebody to just, just, I don't know how to do this. I'm not sure how to do this parenting thing. I'm not sure how to do this adulting thing. I'm not sure how to do this dating thing. I'm not sure how to do this money thing. I'm not sure how to do this career thing. Jesus, I'm not sure how to do this. How do I do it? Has anybody ever been there? Has anybody ever done that? I need some help. A while back, I was trying to fix a toilet in my house. And my wife will tell you, I am not the most, uh, you know, handy of individuals. And so I took the toilet off. That wasn't that hard. I took it off and then I replaced the, the, the seal on it because I thought that was a problem. And then I put the toilet back on and I flushed it and poof, all this water goes all over the floor. I said, this is not good. So I took it all apart again. I put a different seal on it. I, you know, I thought I knew what I was doing. I tried it again. Poof, like an hour goes by. I tried it again poof, for an hour. And before I know it, two hours, I'm sitting on the floor in a pool of toilet water, frustrated out of my mind. And you know who I turn to? I turn to YouTube. That's who I turn to. Who else, right? YouTube, guide me. Show me the way, right? Oh, that guy looks like he knows what he's doing. Let's try that. Ooh, he's got a thousand views. That might be the one. You know, and, and I'm watching. That's, that's the only place I got to go. The only place I have to turn. What a frustration for our hearts to feel like that all we can do is turn to YouTube in a moment. You need a counselor. You need a guide. I read a study by Gallup that just came out. They looked at the mental health from 19 to 20, 2019 to 2020, in various different demographics. They looked at male, female, mental health, both decreased. Surprise, surprise, right? A decrease in mental health, both in men and women, from 2019 to 2020. They looked at old, young, both decreased. They looked at black, white. They looked at rich, poor. They looked at married, single. They looked at all these different demographics. Every single demographic has seen a decrease in mental health from 2019 to 2020. Every single demographic except one. One demographic has seen a slight improvement in mental health from 2019 to 2020, and it is those who attended weekly religious services. Why? Why? Yeah, praise the Lord, right? Why? Why is that such a difference? Because it's those that are going each week saying, I need some counseling. I need some help, God. I need you to be my guide. And it's that posture of heart that begins the transformation, that attitude that says, guide me, Lord. Because there is a fear that lives inside of every single one of us. And if you're not aware of it, that's a tragic place to be because it's there. And it's the fear that you're going to end up alone without a guide. It's a fear that you were born alone, you're going to live alone, and you will die alone. That fear that says that there's no one with me, that there's all I've got is YouTube, that I just got to count on myself, that if it's to be, it's up to me. It's a terror, really that exists in every human heart. And Jesus came today to reveal to your spirit in a way that no natural voice could tell you, but an inner voice will tell you today that he is your guide, that he is your counselor. And if you would even come to him afresh and anew now, he would reveal that he's been guiding you and he'll continue to guide you because he's wonderful. He's wonderful, amen. Oh, so comforting. Wonderful counselor, mighty God. Everybody say mighty. Mighty. It's not a word we use much anymore. It's like mighty mouse, mighty, you know. We don't use mighty much, but it means strong. It means to be strong, you know. I've asked so many people this year, how are you? How are you? I've gotten almost the exact same answer from 95% of people in this current environment. How are you? I'm oh, not bad considering the circumstances, right? Like, listen, things could be worse. I, you know, my aunt, my, my, my neighbor, you know, my, this guy at work, it's way worse. Me, not bad. I'm not bad. I'm not bad, right? And that's great. I'm glad that you're not bad. But I think maybe more than you realize, look at me today. You're tired. I think maybe more than you realize, you're drained. I think maybe more than you realize, the stress has been building on your shoulders. And it's so many things. It's, it's COVID. It's the economy. It's isolation. It's all the racial brokenness of this year. It's the politics of this year. It's the vaccine. It's the questions that go with it. It's, it's the news that just came out recently that uh, there's a new strand of COVID now in London and causing all these problems and, and, and on and on. And just when you think you got a break, there's not a break. It just keeps going and going and, and going and going. And, and you're trying to be strong. You know, you're, you're trying to be 
strong enough, but if you had a moment of honesty, you would have to admit that you're tired of trying. That you're tired of trying. And there's a word for you this Christmas in this name. Mighty God. Mighty God, Jesus is trying to say to you right now, I will be the strength you need. I can give the weak strength. Those that admit they're weak, I make them strong. Those that try to be strong, they have to discover that they're weak. But those that would admit they're weak, I will be their strength. I am mighty God towards you. I was just praying for you today. Praying and I had this picture in my mind. This is how the Holy Spirit speaks to me sometimes. You know, I had this picture in my mind of the Mario brothers. You remember the Mario brothers, right? I went in Mario Brothers, you know, you're cruising along, but you're only this big. You're just a tiny little Mario, you know? And then, whether you realize it or not, sometimes you bump into a mushroom. And when you bump into the mushroom, you go, bleep, 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 bleep. you remember what happens there? And you just get big. You're like five times bigger. And it's like, wow, this guy just got, you know, so much bigger. And you feel better about life when you're big Mario as compared to little Mario. I think so many of us, we've been living like little Mario all year. All year just trying to live this little Mario life, just trying to create this little Mario world, just existing. And I feel like today is your day to bump into a mushroom. Today is your day to experience the presence of Jesus. Today is your day to encounter him and he makes the weak strong. That when we come to him, he proves to our hearts that he is in fact for you right now. A mighty God in Jesus' name. Oh, these are good names. These are good names. Everlasting Father. Everlasting Father. We hear that one and we go, wait, that's weird because Jesus is the son. I thought he was. Why are we calling him Father? The prophet is not getting confused about the Trinity, okay? He is revealed feeling something specific about the Messiah, how the Messiah interacts with us and our hearts. A father is a stabilizing force in a home. We're thankful for moms. We need moms. Thank God for moms. But we also need dads and we need to be fathered. We need to be guided along. We need to be led. We need to be stretched and tested and unconditionally loved. I look at my life and I know that God has fathered me for years and it has made the greatest difference to know that there is someone with a plan, someone who is architecting my future and leading my life. And here's the most comforting part about this name. He says he's the eternal father. Because the truth is, look at me today, you're going to die. And I know that we go to great lengths to not think about that. I know that we go to great lengths to avoid that truth, that we try to trick ourselves. But I think 2020 has forced us into a corner that we have to confront, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to die. We're all going to die. I'm going, what are you going to do when you face death? How are you going to respond? Is it going to be terror and darkness, uncertainty and fear? Or is there one who will father you through that? I'm the everlasting father. You can face even death without fear when you know that I'm with you. Is that real to you? Because it can be. I'm the prince of peace. Shalom. That's that Hebrew word for peace. It means nothing missing, nothing lacking. Is that your experience? That an internal peace rules your heart? I'm the prince of peace, an assurance, a certainty. I've been watching this TV show with my kids recently. I don't know if you've seen it called Alone on the History Channel. It's about 10 guys that get dropped in the wilderness somewhere and they have a few things they can bring with them and they have to survive out there. They got to build a fire. They got to make a camp. They got to protect themselves from bears and, and cougars and whatever else lives out in the woods where they get dropped. They got to find fresh water and whoever quits last wins. And so, you know, they can quit at any time they want. They have a phone. They can just call out and say, get me out of here. I'm done. And so one after another after another, they quit and the final guy wins and he gets $500,000. And, uh, and so I'm watching this, this show and, you know, this one guy, he taps out on day three, which I mean, I'm not out there in the wilderness with them, but I thought day three, that's kind of lame, you know? But again, I'm not there to judge them. I told my boys I'd last like six months, but you know, we, I don't know, we'd see. But, uh, but you know, he taps out on day three and, uh, and they asked him, you know, what made you leave? And he said, well, listen, here's the deal. In my normal day-to-day -day routines, I keep a gun with me all the time, 24-7. You know, I always have a firearm with me, and here I'm not allowed to bring a gun. And as soon as I got out here, I just felt unsafe. I felt uns unsure of myself. I always have it with me. I can feel the gun against my skin, and I just know that I'm safe when I have it. And when I didn't have it, it just started getting to me. And then I started hearing the wolves, and they were out on the hill, and they were, Hoo! 
and I could hear them every night and I could, I could, I just was thinking about them and I didn't have my gun. And I just didn't feel safe. And I just, I had to, I had to get out of there because I lost my sense of safety. Now, this is not a dissertation on the Second Amendment, but I think for many of us, our sense of safety, our gun, our sense of security and stability got taken from us in 2020. It might be your health. It might be the economy. It might be your career. It might be your ability to travel. Whatever it might be, that sense of security, that sense of safety got taken from you. And now you've been listening to wolves all year, listening to these outside voices howling. And it's not just the outside voices, it's the inside voices. You got wolves in your tent. You got your own mind, your thoughts, going crazy, feelings, uncertainties, torturing you on the inside. And you've been listening to it so long, you're like, I got to tap out. I got to get out of this. For some of us, those internal feelings are offenses or hurts. Somebody did something to you and you can't seem to forgive them. You can't seem to let it go. You want to, you choose to, but you still feel all those feelings. For others of us, it's shame. You're not even sure what you're ashamed of, but you have this sense, this cloud that you're not good enough for God. You're not good enough for your spouse. You're not good enough for your career. You're not good enough for your parents. You just feel like you don't measure up. And there's a lack of peace and then Jesus steps in today and says, don't you realize I'm the commander. I'm the prince of shalom. I'm here to give you peace. Listen to his voice today. He says to you, I can give you confidence. I can give you assurance in your heart that you're right with God. I can give you rest about your future. I can give you the ability to finally let that offense go and forgive that person that hurt you. I can give your heart perfect peace. And I think for every one of us, we hear these names and we go, well, Merry Christmas, that sounds great, right? I'd love perfect peace. I'd love strength like Mario. I'd love the mighty God. To show me his truth. I'd love to know that I have an everlasting father. Or a, I'd love to have that sense of confidence. But how, right? How do I do it? It's one thing to say that he is those things. But it's a very different thing to live with those things in my own life. How do I experience the names of Christ in a real way? And friends, don't leave this service without catching this truth. Because it's the most important thing we're going to talk about today. And it's the very point of why Isaiah wrote the prophecy. He begins with these words, for to us. In other words, something's been done to us. It's not something that we must do. It's something that we must acknowledge or become aware of. And he says, for to us, a child is born. I love that. God is going to give you your blessing and your solution in the precise opposite way that you expected. You thought it would be big with trumpets and gold and power. And instead it comes in a manger, small, insignificant, and easy to overlook. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. To us, a son, a son, a son. He's talking about the great mystery mystery of all mysteries, the great wonder of all wonders beyond Disney World, beyond the stars, beyond the birth of a child, this great mystery that there is a God who created the cosmos, a God who designed the core of the universe, a God who knows the name of every single star and every single planet, who knows just the speed and velocity of every moving thing of all time and all space. This God became flesh. He became human, a child and a son. This this great convergence of divinity and humanity. God became man. The word became flesh. The author entered the story. This is the secret, the mystery, the profound power of Christmas. For to us, God came, right? He came. But if you really want to grasp how we experience the names of Christ as he's described in Isaiah 9. We have to focus in on that little word that comes after son. For to us a child is born, for to us a son is given. The givenness of God. Oh, Gaze into a great wonder with me. That he did not just come to be a good example or to be a model for us. He came to be the gift your heart needs most. He came to become the gift for you. 
See, at Christmas time, we all give gifts to each other. It's the only time all year that you give gifts to different people. Like you might give a gift to somebody for their birthday or an anniversary, and that's fine. But this, this time of year, you give gifts to all kinds of people. To your, your, your cousin, to your brother, to your friend at work. To, they give, you know, all, all different types of people, different gifts. That's the whole point of this season. And I think sometimes we forget that that's why we do that. We do it because it's just tradition or it's something we feel obligated to do sometimes. But really, the tradition began because it was a way for our hearts to remember the profoundly wonderful gift that has been given. The gift that really violates even our sense of gifts because it's so glorious and wonderful. The gift that we very often resist because it te- seems far too good to be true. The gift that you're resisting even now, which is the root of the reason why you're not experiencing Christ as he's described in those names that we just looked at. This gift. See, when Jesus came, he came as what theologians call a representative man. It's a strange thought to our mind, but what he wants us to understand about that is that Christ represents all people when he came. See, the scripture describes Adam, the first man, as a representative. And when Adam sinned, all sinned and fell short of the glory of God, that we inherited a broken nature because of Adam's sin, because he represented all people. So Christ came as what the Bible describes as the last Adam or the second man. He came as a representative for all people. And so when he lived a holy and perfect life, he didn't just do it as an example or as a model for you. He did it as a representative of you before God. And so when Christ chose the cross, and we're sure that he chose the cross, it wasn't just political confusion that led him to the cross. He knew exactly what he was getting into, what he was doing, and what he was choosing. He chose the cross, and when he did, he became a substitute for your sins. And so God could see your life before you were even born. He could see all your sin from birth to death. He could see the times and the seasons of which you would live. He could see every time you violated his law, every time you thought an evil thought or act in a wicked way. He saw all your sin and he collected the debt of that sin. And when Christ hung on the cross, he took your debt from before you were born, saw it all, took your debt and he placed it on the shoulders of Jesus Christ. And there on the cross as the perfect man bled and died, he exchanged places with you so that your debt could be forgiven and he could then give you a gift, the gift of his righteousness, the gift of his position, the gift of his perfection before God forever. And so in that moment, a profound exchange took place. An exchange that is so massive that it frustrates our mind and it's difficult for us to grasp. And in that exchange, he gave you a new position before God. Look at Hebrews chapter 10 with me. It says, for by one sacrifice, speaking of the cross, he, that is Christ, has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Allow those thoughts to germinate in your soul because there's something in you, a pride that will resist it, but God wants to drive it into you today. It says that even before you have lived perfect in holiness, he's already decreed you perfect in standing through the sacrifice of his son. <laughs> Let it get into your heart. Look at how Colossians 1 says it. Check this out. But now, everybody say now. Now he has reconciled you, reconciled you. You are at odds with God. You were uncertain of your standing before him. You thought he was punishing you for something that happened 10 years ago. But now he's reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death. A physical act by a physical man who lived in a physical world, gave himself for all people and through death to present you. How now do you see God? How does God see you present you holy in his sight. Somebody's got to circle that in their Bible. Without blemish and free from accusation. Is this true? Free from accusation, not just for today, not just for tomorrow, but for eternity. Free from all accusation. Never judged for a single sin. Perfect, blameless, spotless, and without blemish forever. This is the gift that the Bible calls grace. Grace! Oh, your heart needs it far more than you realize. And our hearts resist it far more than we realize. Because it's only in the acceptance, the full, free, and radical acceptance of grace that you and I begin to understand Jesus for who he really is and really can be. A wonderful counselor. He can guide me because the shame has been removed. And I can hear him clearly by faith. A mighty God. He can strengthen me because he lives inside me. Christ in me. The hope of glory. And as I trust in Christ in me, I find a strength that is beyond human strength. 
mighty God, everlasting Father. I don't fear death because I know that he'll walk with me. I know that he'll guide me across the pass and I will see him face to face and be known just as I am known by him. Mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, I can finally rest whether my business succeeds or fails, whether my bank account grows or does not, whether things around me are falling apart or building up, I can rest because I know I have eternal rest in him. A son has been given and the government would be upon his shoulders. Yes, that means that all the earth will worship Jesus one day, that he will return, that this is truth, but it also means that he decides he is the king who decides how he will see you. And he has said over all those who are in Christ Jesus, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. So if you are condemning yourself for something that Christ says you're forgiven of, then you have not placed the government on his shoulders. You're still allowing your judgments, your decisions, your perspective to overrule his own. And you'll never know him as the Prince of Peace if you're doing that. You must place your government on his shoulders. So have you? Have you surrendered to Christ? Is there a part of your life that you've made off limits? Because you'll never know him as wonderful counselor and mighty God until you put your government on his shoulders. Until you put your judgments, your decisions, your perspective and allow his truth to inform it above your own. Have you surrendered your life to Christ? Have you trusted him fully? Have you taken that step to really believe what he says about you and chosen it? Because you remember the story, right? Do you remember the story of the wise men who came to Herod and said, a king has been born in Bethlehem. And Herod said, oh, that's great news. But on the inside, Herod wasn't excited about Jesus being born. He was threatened. He thought that his kingdom was going to fall apart if another king arrived. And so he sent men to kill the babies of Bethlehem. So it is also with us that many of us, when we hear of grace, we actually feel threatened. We say, I want to control my life. I want to decide what I want to do. I want to plan out my dreams and mark out my course. I don't want God deciding for me. What if he picks something that I don't like? And we resist the kingdom of God. And we discover in the process that we lose life itself. Or maybe you're a little bit more like Bethlehem. Because you remember the story of how Mary and Joseph arrive in Bethlehem. And they say, there's no room for you here. We can't make space for you. I think some of us, we hear the message of grace, but we don't make space for it in our lives. We don't make the space or the room for that truth to abide, for that truth to remain, for that truth to be born in us. And so we hear about grace, but we think it's for somebody else. We still try to earn God's favor. We still try to prove that we're good enough. We still try to add up our accolades to show him that we're righteous enough. But friend, if you're ever going to know grace, you have to not just repent of your sin. You have to also repent of your righteousness. In other words, you can't come with your righteous record and say, God, I'm 87% there. Do you think you could just get me the last 13%? No, the scripture says your righteousness is filthy rags. You are not a bad person who needs to be made good or a kind of good person who needs to be made better. According to Christ, you're a dead person who needs to be made alive. And so you have to come with 0% and allow him to come with 100%. Repent of your righteousness. And when you do, you discover the free gift of righteousness that he gives. Oh, come Holy Spirit. He's trying to get your heart because here's the point of the text. That the reason you don't know him as Prince of Peace or Mighty God is because somewhere, somehow, you're resisting the gift. Paul called it the stumbling stone of grace because so many people trip over it, try to add to it, prove they're worthy of it. But instead, Christmas must be received. Just receive. What could happen if even right now, you just receive the acceptance, kindness, forgiveness, mercy of God. What could happen in your own heart if just afresh and anew you received the wonder of this simple truth? He loves you. Oh, hear it in your soul today. There's a God who loves you. You've been misinterpreting circumstances. You've been coming to false conclusions. But the truth is, He loves you. He loves you. You say, prove it. He already did on the cross. And he sent me here to tell you it again today. 
that the root of your fear and anxiety, the root of your uncertainty, the root of your frustration and offense is a resistance to the truth of that love. So would you receive Christmas now? With all of our locations in here, would you stand up with me today? We're going to pray. I believe that um, in the next few moments, the Holy Spirit is calling you to a personal encounter. And so I want to urge you, first and foremost, to place your government on His shoulders, your judgments, your opinions, your sense of control, your fears, your laws, your policies. Place them on His shoulders today. And then turn to Jesus. Turn from sin. If there's anything in your life that would be in opposition to God, open your hand to Him right now. And then receive again the gift of Christ. Would you close your eyes and bow your head with me? Do you need counsel? Maybe you're facing a situation, you're just not sure what to do. Ask Him to be your counselor. You need strength. Maybe you're tired of being strong. The tank's on empty. Ask Him to be your strength. Do you need a father? A steady hand. Who will guide you? Stay with you. Ask Him to father you. Do you need peace? Because your world has been spinning. Ask him to be the prince of peace. Lord Jesus, spirit of the living God, come. Manifest the truth of your name today in our hearts, in our minds, in our souls. Spirit of God, breathe. In Jesus' name.